All right, good afternoon, everybody. So, um, knowledge integration for the environmental sciences. What do I mean by knowledge integration? Well, first, I want to go back and um, define, at least for our purposes this afternoon, another buzzword you may have heard a bit about lately. This is data science. And I say that data science is the construction of knowledge through the interdisciplinary analysis of data. And so, that is, um, for instance, statistics, um, but it's much more than statistics. It also involves the um, intellectual enterprise involved in data representation and management, data visualization, data description, um, machine learning and data mining, and uh, also, finally, dynamical modeling. And I think often in the environmental sciences, which I construe quite broadly, we need to do many of these different activities, and we need to do them in an integrated way because of the multiple data streams that we're working with and the end users for our data products and analyses. Knowledge integration, I'll say then, is that part of data science that's concerned with uh, synthesizing particularly multiple data sets or data streams that come from different sources, uh, data munging as some people call it, statistical learning, uh, and modeling. Um, I think that the environmental sciences are just completely shot through with problems for knowledge integration. And so it's one of the big things that we're interested in working on. Uh, what do I do in my lab? Um, we are uh, our modelers that uh, take quite a wide-ranging, freewheeling uh, point of view on data analysis. We're interested in all things quantitative when it comes to uh, environmental sciences, ecology, and epidemiology. Um, what I'm going to do with uh, the next couple of minutes is just describe for you two pr uh, projects, uh, two general themes in the lab from the last couple of years. Um, with the intention that you might see connections to your work either by analogy or just to give you kind of a sense of the, the flavor of the kind of work that we do. So the first has to do with um, developing online algorithms for tipping points. Uh, tipping points refers to critical transitions, the, the, the sense that sometimes a complex, low-dimensional, nonlinear dynamical system will operate in one mode and then all of a sudden it switches to another mode. Um, so one example is uh, explosive behavior. These are things like uh, species invasions or outbreaks of, um, of infectious disease. Uh, another possibility is um, bistable systems. So you can have coral reefs that are dominated by one set of, uh, of animal fauna or by another. And they tend to switch back and forth. Shallow lakes can be typically in either a clear state or uh, a sedimented state. Um, and switching back and forth between those two states is of interest to land managers. Uh, it turns out many of these tipping points can be described using a potential diagram. Uh, there's a picture here of a potential diagram and basically the idea is uh, the, uh, the ball wants to roll to the lowest point that it has accessible to it. And by changing the nature of the system, changing the ground rules, you change the shape of that, uh, of that basin of attraction. So this is a graphical illustration, but it's actually uh, underlain by a rigorous uh, mathematical theory in dynamical systems. So it, it's not just a picture, uh, but there's a, a mechanistic theory underlying it as well. And what we've been interested in is when you're taking data from such a system that come in time series, so repeated measurements of something, are there signatures in those data that can tell you you're close to one of those tipping points? And the answer is that there is. This is due to a dynamical phenomenon called critical slowing down. And the goal of our work has been to develop algorithms that can detect critical slowing down in data sets that might be subject to uh, different kinds of sampling processes or corruption or, or um, other things that get in the way. So we've published a little bit on this over the last few years. And it's one of the, the main going concerns in the lab at the moment. All right, so uh, online algorithms for tipping points, that's one thing you could, uh, you could do with quantitative methods. Uh, another has to do with the generic problem of what do you do when you've got data that come from an awkward or maybe an observational surveillance process. This is a found data set, uh, a convenience sample, and you don't have a probability model for how you actually acquired the data. What a Bayesian does is they pro pro uh, pro propose a model for how the data was acquired. We want to do something different. We want to get a different data stream and offer a way of correcting those data uh, so that they're in proportion to, uh, to the way that you would have sampled if you'd sampled randomly. And by developing these model agnostic, what we call data calibration techniques, we've tried to make use of, uh, of information such as found observations of the locations of species in a geographic space 
in order to produce habitat models and species distributions. Uh, model products like that that are actually useful to decision making and inference and, uh, and environmental management. So these two, um, these two tasks, online learning for tipping points and model agnostic data calibration, I think are just two examples of the kinds of things that, um, that we use quantitative uh, methods for. And if you are interested in learning further, I would point you to um, one of these websites which details some of the projects or just send me an email or stop by the office. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Thanks.